Last week I posted a video about pronation and orthotics and that some people struggle to pronate efficiently and thus uh, when you can't pronate efficiently you can't move forward in other words walk you can't walk forward without compensation occurring somewhere higher up usually in the in the in the leg and the hip and that will often cause people to go back into that left AIC pattern but I wanted to mention like who else would benefit so people who cannot get neutral in terms of PRI testing uh, and people who cannot maintain neutrality may, be, may want to investigate the use of orthotics because the orthotic will allow you, again, will allow you to move forward through proper supination, pronation, resupination as you push off. So heel, arch, big toe, keeping all those important joints, that big toe, well, the big, yeah, uh, the big toe, uh, the ankle and the knee in a good alignment so that you can move forward without having to compensate somewhere else. When you can't pronate, you go into those compensations and again, it's gonna may cause you to repattern. Uh, so anyone who has had the structural integrity of their feet, ankle or tibias, their lower legs, or even maybe their femurs, uh, if that structural integrity has been compromised through maybe you were born like that like my left foot is not it's just doesn't it's just has too high of an arch it's too it's got this metatarsis adductus to it uh, so i was born with a structural issue that i do believe prevents me from pronating properly because even just with within the week with about four days after getting them and starting to wear them again i started to feel myself pushing through my big toes through the tip of my big toes where that wasn't happening before. And I started to feel my left heel just standing uh, intensely for about an hour. My left, my left heel simply felt like it was like 100 pounds. And that was a good thing because we always want more left heel. So anyone who has a structural, I don't want to say deformity, but like a structural issue where their joints cannot align properly to move forward without compensation. So you could be born with it. It could occur over time from repeated injuries, repeated ankle sprains, breaks, breaks in the femur, breaks in the tibia, uh, a varus or valgum anytime you're kind of bow-legged or if your knees collapse in and thus your feet collapse in. Anything, anything like that may require the use of a orthotic uh, to allow, not for necessarily for support, remember this is to allow for correct biomechanical supination, pronation, resupination as you're moving forward so that you do not have to compensate somewhere else. Um, the ortho and this is from the sheet that was sent to me with my new orthotics. The orthotics are built to change your biomechanics. The orthotics are built to change your biomechanics and make your feet function more efficiently. They're not making them for support. So, you know, talk about intrinsic muscle strength and just work on strengthening your muscles. That, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, they are built to change your biomechanics and make your feet function more efficiently so you do not have to compensate. Uh, we expect you to be comfortable in your orthotics. If you have been experiencing the pain of an injury or poorly functioning feet or other misalignments, it may take some time to achieve this. The orthotics may be changing years of foot, muscle, and tendon dysfunction. With improved biomechanics, the entire lower extremity, the entire leg up into the hip, and the whole body really, will function more efficiently. That's important to realize because if that's not occurring, you, you lose grounding. And I talk about grounding a lot on this channel. And I know it's a very abstract term, but I'm going to show you what I mean by grounding. So the first picture you're going to see is uh, a picture of me before teaching a class. And you'll notice that my right arm has a lot more range of motion. That would be a passing test. If someone was moving that arm down further into shoulder, into shoulder horizontal abduction, it would have gone further. That's just me just letting it hang. So in that test, that is a good test. The after picture, my right arm has a lot less range of motion. Why is that? 
because as I was teaching my class, I don't even know what shoes I had on, but because dancing, you strike when you're dancing, uh, any Latin dancing, but it was salsa. When you're dancing salsa, you're always hitting, so this is the ground, this is the foot, you're always hitting the ground with the forefoot. You're never hitting with a heel. So you're not going through proper foot mechanics as your brain knows your foot's hitting the ground for hours, because I, I was teaching a lot back then. So what happened? I lost my sense of ground, and in the second picture, that limited range of motion, that is reflecting a body that has gone into extension. Your back will arch, your neck will come forward, and you will start to overuse your neck for breathing. And I'm gonna show you what that's gonna look like. Uh, but the important thing to remember is, that is a grounding issue. As I was teaching my class, I became ungrounded because I was no longer going through heel, arch, big toe, because as you're dancing, you're striking the ground with the forefoot, not with the heel, because that's the nature of the dance. In the last video, I mentioned that people who had general hypermobility syndrome, they called it GPS, feel their weight towards the ball of their feet. If they're only feeling the ball of their feet, is that any different than what occurred with me? No, we're both striking the ground with the ball of our feet. So we're both ungrounded at that point. And those general hypermobility syndromed people will be ungrounded. They will be extended. Once you lose ground, you extend to tighten up and to protect so you don't fall. It's the same thing. I was putting myself into general hypermobility syndrome, except I really wasn't, but I was putting myself into extension. I would be feeling my weight in the same area. I was putting my weight into the same area that hypermobile people sense the ground underneath their feet in the forefoot. Once you're feeling too much forefoot, you have to extend. And that's just the pattern. And so when I'm done teaching, my range of motion has been decreased because I am extended. And if you're extended, your arm can't go back far enough. Get your ribs back and now your arms go further. So once you get neutral, you get the, that arm range of motion, shoulder range of motion. It's not the shoulders though, it's the rib cage. You extend and that's what cuts down the range of motion. Now the moment you extend and you cut down your range of motion and your weight comes forward, chest comes forward, back is arched, you're now living like that and you will start to overuse your neck because you've lost your diaphragms, particularly on the left. You have to still get air. And what are you gonna do? You're gonna to start to use your neck. And these two videos show what neck breathing looks like. Now, I think sometimes people refer to this as chest breathing. The idea of chest breathing, I think it's mixed up. We need our chest to expand out because our lungs are up there. We don't want our chest to go straight up and down. Some people call that chest breathing because they see the chest doing this. I call it neck breathing, all right? But you're gonna see, as you see in this video, uh, look at their neck muscles. They are really pulling up as they breathe. And that type of breathing, as you can tell, they are anxious. <laughs> they are uh, in a state of fight or flight. Alarm bell is going off in their head. They're going through an anxious time. That's how you breathe during those moments where you're anxious and you're, and you're trying to react to stressful situations. You should not be breathing like that when you're reading a book, when you're watching TV, when you're simply walking, and that's the difference. People who are constantly extended because they've lost the ground are using their neck to breathe like those video clips even when they're at rest, and that is a breathing dysfunction. And that can lead to all sorts of issues. And it's gonna to lead to restricted ranges of motion. You're going to go into that PEC position. Your back is gonna be extra arched and now you get caught in that position. And the more you use your neck, the more ungrounded you become. And now uh, things can get a little bit more difficult. Either way, people need to reground through proprioceptive sense of the ground, so their feet through their particular heels, and then the left heel and the right arch, they need to ground, they then need to expand the rib cage to get air into the rib cage so the neck can relax, and now you don't need to use your neck to breathe like you saw in those videos. And at that point, you should get full range of motion in their shoulders, and that's what that test is really showing, uh, whether that, that rib cage can expand 
with air appropriately and how much tension is being held through the anterior neck and the, the uh, upper chest.